You're listening to Fishing the DMV with your hosts, Thomas Ahrens and Jared Mounts. Fishing the DMV is brought to you by Jake's Bait and Tackle, located in Winchester, Virginia. If that doesn't get you jacked up, I don't know what will. The uh, Susquehanna is low. When I tell you it's low, it's, it's nasty low. low. The uh, area I go out of is Goldsboro when it's this low. Okay. Goldsboro, Pennsylvania. There's a power. There's a nuclear power plant there that's famous for almost melting down in 1980. <laughs> Wait, <laughs> really? Yeah, it's called the Three Mile Island. You ever heard of it? No. <laughs> Look it up one of these days. So, <clears throat> have you ever eaten at Hooters? They, they, they sell a, a type of wing that's called a um, uh, the hottest one's called Three Mile Island. <laughs> so, I never even knew that. Yeah. Oh. Is there, wasn't there like an, a warm water discharge on the upper Potomac at some point too? I thought there yeah. was like a, okay. Is that still a thing or did they shut yeah. that down? Okay. Mm-mm. Dickerson doesn't even run anymore. Oh Jesus. I remember as a kid, old guys telling me like back in the day in the winter time, you go there, that place used to stack up. Like I'm sure. Yeah. It's funny in fishing how um, everyone always talks about the glory days, right? I'm sure you, you hear that all the time. It's, Especially everything the- in life. Yeah. You know, whether it's like fishing, politics or whatever, or money. Like, I remember people tell me it's like, oh, you guys just don't work hard enough now. It's like, like with student loans and stuff. Like back in your days, probably yeah. was nickel. Now, it's yeah. like $500,000 a semester. It's just everything's getting more expensive. <laughs> yeah. I mean, 50 years ago, they, people didn't pull loans out for anything. If you didn't have the money, you didn't buy a car. No, exactly. Like, and nowadays, like, if you want to buy a new truck, I'm looking at getting a new truck. Oh. Dude, I'm like, even a used truck. It's insane. Yeah. I, I think mean, the price of used vehicles will go down now. I hope so. Cause I'm really looking like, I want to get something a little bit like a 2,500 or a 250 size just to pull the boat with something with a little bit more meat to be able mm-hmm. to pull and stop. Um, and I'm looking about, I want to get a new motor for my boat at some point, but then that's, it's like, is it cheaper to get a new motor put on the boat or is it better just to get a whole new rig? together? It's like so crazy how expensive everything. Yeah, everything. I mean, if, if you went from, you have a, a glass boat, yeah, I got a glass boat. If, if you went from a, a glass boat to a big uh, aluminum boat, it'd be cheaper, you know, and put an outboard on the back, you know, it, it, equivalent to what you got as a glass boat. I'm thinking about either getting an, ex- like, if I got an aluminum, it probably would still have to have a big engine on it because I want to get a smaller jet boat. Uh, like mm-hmm. a perfect world, perfect world eventually before I retire, I went to, I want a jet boat and a, and a, a, a big water boat. I'm thinking like the Express. The Express is supposed to be a good aluminum boat. Oh, sure. Sure. Yeah, they are. I mean, if you had, if you won the lottery, what kind of boat would you get? I'd have one built. Oh, shit. Yeah. You got, you got a brand in mind? Um, that company, what's it called? James uh, James River is one of them. Hmm. James River Jet Boats or James River Jets. Get, can you, are you pulling it up right now? Yeah, James River. If it pops up. He should still be in business. I've been in them before. Let's see if I can find one here. Jet boats. This might be it. Do they have a website though? Oh, I don't know. He's an older guy. Oh, uh, okay. That might be. Uh, do you no. Know? We got New River Jet Boats. Huh. I know the Raptor boat. Um, rock proof. That came up. Yeah, th- those are all inboards. I want an outboard. What is your vibes on the the inboard versus outboard thing? I I, th- I think they're difficult to work on. And people people don't want to work on them. And I, I don't understand how that Rotax motor is going to be um, that much better than these outboard motors. These are kind of nice. What are those? River Road Jet Boats? Yeah, see, they have an outboard. That actually looks pretty dope. Yeah, see, I, I want one with a stick steer up front, man. Something like that. Okay. Because if, when I'm guiding, I can just, I can literally just sit up and drop the trolling motor. You, oh. can't, you know, that, that technology that, that, um, that Mencota has, that old Altera. Yeah. That deploys and everything. It, it's just not, um, it's not, it, it's nowhere near being perfected. You can't run that motor 200 plus days a year and expect it to deploy every time it, it'll, it gets damaged. And, and if it gets slightly bent or hits a rock or something, it doesn't, uh, stow correctly. Gotcha, gotcha, gotcha. Like, but does that have like spot lock on it too? Oh yeah. How, what that has a cool that? that has a cool feature that 
none of these other trolling motors do, but it sits on the same platform as a Taroba, mm -hmm. but it's, it's got that motor that allows it to deploy and stow. But if they would take the Taroba and put the trim motor on it, the Taroba would be awesome. The trim motor, the electric trim, though I can hit a button and I can raise the motor up and down without physically having to twist a knob and lift it up and down myself. That is freaking awesome. They have that technology on the Altera, and it's uh, it's probably the coolest thing about it. Not the stowing or the deploying, which is neat. But like I said, there's so many moving parts that, that, that they're not reliable. Mm -hmm. I've had one. so I have the Altrex, and so far that's been pretty good for the spot lock feature. Well, I, mean, like, like, yeah. I cannot... I, I can't fish without spot lock now. I am so freaking pampered. It's like if if you had your druthers, like a power pole or a spot lock trolling motor, that's a hard pick because being able to just keep your boat in positioning while you fiddle with tackle and stuff. Yeah. I can't imagine you as a guide where you don't have to deal with them dealing with the trolling motor. You can just hit a button. Like, yeah. That's so freaking awesome to do. I, I can't believe people are still using power poles. What would you use? Just a spot lock. Yeah. On yeah. one of those big big um bass boats i don't even think i'd have uh power poles i i think yeah i mean i think if you're like in florida like uh, it makes more sense like where it's only three feet deep everywhere yeah but everywhere else no not at all but yeah like something like that like i wouldn't want a 17 footer i would want something a little bit smaller like i don't know 16 15 because it's usually just me just something with a jet on it yeah man not break yeah I, I don't know about mercury's versus evan roots James, well, Evan Roods don't even exist anymore, right? Really? Evan Rood went out of business, didn't they? Yeah, I, they went out of I business. They did. Shit. They, they had the only motor that I know of on the market that was a two stroke um, fuel injection. Huh. So I could have gone up a motor. So that, that they're expensive. And when I needed to put a new motor on my boat, I couldn't afford the uh, Evan Rood. I had to buy the Mercury. But the Evan Rood, I could have gone a size up. Because really? it, they're about 50 pounds lighter every time you go up. Huh. Like the one that was equivalent to my size was was 50 pounds lighter than what I have now. Okay. Okay. Could it, how, what is the size of your Mercury then? What are you running? It's a 60 40. It's a 60 horsepower motor. Okay. Is it a four stroke or is it still two stroke? No, no, no. It's a four stroke. Well, that's got to be nice though. Fuel injected. Yeah. I mean, at least with gas prices and shit, like it's got to be easier to deal with that. The four stroke. Oh yeah. It, um, if, if you don't, if you don't run it wide open and you just putt around, it saves, uh, or it, it, it barely, uh, sucks up any gas. How much gas are you using right now? Oh my gosh, man. I, I don't even want to, I don't even want to tell you. I mean, the, the monthly bill on my mm -hmm. gas is incredible. It's Ab bad. Above or below 200. Oh, well, no, it's way above 200. Oh, damn. Yeah, I have a it's, diesel truck right now and I, I can feel you there. Yeah, it's um um it's uh, it's it's just under a thousand. Jesus. And again, like when people complain, because I, I saw a post from um uh uh CC down at, at Lake Anna McCotter who does uh the guiding down there, and he's like mm -hmm. hey, prices because of petrol. And some people in the comment section were scoffing. It's like, dude, like you gotta like this is kind of how like marketing works and stuff. Capitalism. Like, what do you expect? Especially with all the shit going on in the world right now. It's like, yeah, you got to raise your prices to be able to survive. You know, they stop making food. You got to raise your prices at a restaurant. If you make your living with petrol, having petrol in your tank, you got to, you got to survive, especially if it's going to become like six, $7 a gallon. I mean, which is, I don't know, man, it's freaking. It's all for three ninety two. <sighs> That's good. For, um, Westminster, Maryland. That's not bad. I'm a, I got diesel in my truck, so it's, it's still going to suck for me. <laughs> yeah. I don't, um, the, the diesel, I, I don't understand why that price has gone up so much. Yeah. Explain that to me in any sense, why that's it's supposed to be, uh, more fuel efficient, isn't it? I thought it would be too. And again, like, you know, I got a big 350 truck. Um, so usually when I fill up, I don't have to fill up very much, but it's, it's usually a $200 bill when I fill up. Same thing with my boat, it's just because my boat has mm -hmm. 100 gallon tanks, which again, it's like, I don't know, man. Anyway, yeah. Hey, it's, my my tank is only twelve gallons, and I fill my truck up on my tank. That's how much money gas is. Mm. Well, then how long how long does a tank of gas give you on the river? Is that oh my gosh, water? man? I can I can in a trip I'll burn an entire tank of gas. Okay. Yeah, uh, going after fish. Damn. That I'll run. Yeah. Um. What was it? Thursday. 
I ran, uh, I would, I would guesstimate I ran probably 25 miles. Wow. In my boat up and back. Yeah. I went from Edwards Ferry up to Point of Rocks and back. I would say that's close to 25. Actually, Easy. I had to check that real quick. It's somewhere between 25 and uh, somewhere, somewhere in the neighborhood of 20 to 25. Edwards Ferry. There's Point of Rocks. Yeah, right there. All the way up down up up here towards Brunswick. Yeah, um, where wherever Point of Rock, yeah, Point of Rocks, and then south. Oh, south. It's just too mm. shallow to run any anywhere else right now. Mm. Yeah, keep going down because that's the Monocacy right there. Dude, why not just like freaking lawns closer? <laughs> well, because because there's so much like dead water. Oh, okay, there's gotcha. So much, the water's so shallow. Um, you want to find, and, and the structure is that far apart from, from, uh, each hole, like the uh, area areas to catch fish. Dang, dude, that's insane. Like now when you're, I mean, it's actually an interesting, like, like financial question. If fuel prices got worse, do you start planning trips differently about how you approach finding the fish? Yeah, I, I just, I, I couldn't run. I mean, it would, it, some of the trips just wouldn't be very good at all. Mm -hmm. I would like, just have to guess and um, and and float most of the time and just use my uh, trolling motor. Yeah, because I think like you just wouldn't want to make as many long runs trying to figure no. things out. But um, I mean, what was it? Thursday? I mean, we caught over thirty fish, but we ran all over the place. You know, I mean, water's 80, 82 degrees. Eighty-two degrees. Good lord. Yeah. What was it like a what was it like a month ago? Was it was it seven? It was no, I saw it. Um the highest I've seen it this year was 86. 86? Okay. Yeah. Wow. Dang, dude. That's that insane. was in July at some point. But you know, it probably spiked up to, to that and then and then went down, you know, um a day or two later. So where where do you usually launch from on this river? Like I know, I don't think I've ever asked you that at all the times we any and um a lot of times I, I launch from Edwards Ferry because the boating because it's safe to take people out there. Okay. And then from there, Edwards, Seneca, go all the way down. If you go past Edwards Ferry, I, I put in at Seneca, which is down by Dam Two. You see where Seneca is? I see there's Seneca right here, little Seneca. Well, Seneca Creek, um, Riley's Lock area. There we go. Zoom in a little bit more. Is that Seneca Creek right there? The Seneca yeah. Creek. Yep. And then Dam Two exists or used to exist right right around here somewhere, down down below a little bit. No, nope, ab above the islands. Oh, above them. Gotcha. It was down. Yeah. And then um, I, I from Seneca Creek all the way up. But I like going out of Edwards Ferry. But when the water's higher, I'll go out of Point of Rocks. Okay. Um, I like going out of Lander. And if the water's um, if, if if the water's high enough, I'll go up around Shepherdstown. If it's ever high there, my God. Yeah. <laughs> That's yeah, so I just drop around. Oh, I like going out of um, Mouth of Monocacy too. Monocacy is good. Monocacy is good. You've told me a couple of times like that's like a hidden gem when it comes to largemouth fishing. Yeah. Uh, how shallow? I mean, we talked about the Susquehanna. Like, how shallow is like the Potomac right now? I mean, is it like record breaking? No, no, it, no, no, no. It's um. It's about Edwards Ferry. It's about three and a half feet. It's, it's about where it should be in the summertime. Okay. That's not bad. It's nothing, nothing terrible. Have you ever fished down like closer to the falls? Does it get deeper down there? Yeah. Around, uh, you mean great falls? Yeah. Yeah. There's a, uh, there's like a, uh, an area where it gets real deep down there. Um, I, I've never fished down there though. A gorge. I forget what they call it. Something gorge. Is it like dangerous or just, just never? Probably. Never? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I would say, yeah, because it's so close to the falls. That oh, water, that oh, water's sure. well, that water's rolling. You mean like right in here then? Yeah. That water's rolling. Because I thought there was some place I heard some some people from Ashburn say you can launch a big boat. And maybe it was oh, Algonquian. Really? I think it's Algonquian. Oh, Algonquian's just north of Seneca. Is it just north of Seneca? Okay. It's on maybe the Virginia it's... side. Yep. Okay, maybe it's that. Yeah. Yeah. I just yeah. yeah. Mm, God, this map sucks. Navionics. If you hear this in the uh, when I when I finally launch this episode, could you please update the mapping on the Upper Potomac because it just flat out sucks. 
like this and uh, the Susquehanna. Like I looked at a Susquehanna map. It's like, I don't know how, I mean, like, clearly it really is for you guys, you guys, like you just are on the water so much, you know where to run. But if you're mm -hmm. like a retard like me and you get out there, you're going to just completely destroy your boat because the mapping you have, is just terrible. Well, the, uh, well, cause that none of that water is, uh, it, it, no. none of it's been charted. It's, it's all un unnavigable waters. So, so, so they just leave them alone and um, don't do anything with them. Now, are you running the GPS just to mark stuff? Like, like, are you just running by memory or what do you? No, I, I use a GPS too. You use a GPS too? Yeah. Okay, yeah. Well, well, so before we get, uh, I guess before we get into like the full fishing report, um, did you want to do the fishing report now or do you want to do the yeah. fluke fishing or how, how would you want to do it? Let's do the, uh, the, uh, fishing report. Okay, sweet. Let me, uh pop the screen and just yeah go for it all right so um right now i've been fishing between uh um edwards ferry and uh point of rocks and the water at edwards ferry somewhere around three three and a half feet okay and point of rocks is is um around one and a half and that never really changes those uh whatever there's like a two two and a half foot difference between those two gauges. And they're always like that. Now I've seen them every once in a while, once in a blue moon, one will be higher than the other one. It, it'll be like out of whack because there's more water somewhere than, than somewhere else. Mm. You have to be real careful when you're running the river and it's, and it's low. Um, but uh, the fishing I've been using small plastics, uh, little creature bait. I have, uh, it looks like a Helger mite. Oh, cool. And Catching a lot of uh, a lot of fish on that. Let me see. Do I? I don't have one with me right now. But um, I'm using black and green pumpkin. The uh, other plastics that I'm using, I'm using swim baits, four inch swim baits. I was using Kytex, trying to get try to use them up. I have a mold for them now, Smart. so I just I just pour them. Um, and we're catching right now. We're we're catching fish anywhere from you know ten inches to 18, 19 inches. How many swim baits do you like? Do they last a decent amount of time, regardless no. of the brand, just in general? Or do you go no. through a, the fish tear them up? Yeah, that's where go, going to a mold is probably a smart thing for you. It's just going to be cheaper. Yeah, the, the the fish destroy them, rip their tails up. You'll you'll put a brand new Kytec on and you'll throw it out, and they rip the tail of it off. <laughs> that's where that last tech shit. Like I don't know if you saw, but um, shit with Z Man, they're coming mm. out with um like smaller versions of everything like down to like an inch and an inch and a half oh, wow. which is going to be just murder on some of these like small mouth places too. yeah yes yeah. but um the, hey, the the water right now is um down by edwards ferry it, it, it seems a lot more stained than it is up around point of rocks and further north and i believe the reason why that is is because um around point of rocks there's a lot of aquatic grass growing mm -hmm. right now I mean, there's a lot. By the end of August, I don't think you'll be able to go between um, from from uh, mouth of Monocacy and get up to the point of rocks. So, guys, just for um, for viewers at home. So this right here is is uh, let me scoot in some more so you guys can see this is point of rocks right here where he's talking about. Um, and then so Monocacy is all the way down right here, if I'm not mistaken. So what yep. he's talking about is between Monocacy and point of rocks. There's a lot of vegetation, which is also kind of a good thing, too. And it comes oh, to no, it is. Too. Um, just for our, our viewers that are kind of new to this, uh, aquatic vegetation, good. Please do not kill it. We need this to help with next generation of smallmouth and stuff. It's all good stuff. Uh, but you know, no, continue. And then Edwards Ferry is, is down below the Monocacy for viewers. Yeah. That don't know. Yep. Keep, keep right running down. You'll pass. Uh, there should be a spot for White's Ferry. You'll see it. Maybe, maybe not. Uh, Edwards is somewhere right there, in there. There we go. So here's Leesburg. Yeah. Edwards is. is somewhere. Yeah, yep, there it is, right there. Yep. Is is that what it did? It show Edwards Ferry there. It shows. I know this is. I just know this is Whites. Oh, that's White Ferry. Yeah, this go go further south. And just keep going. Right here. Yeah, that's Goose Creek right there, across on the Virginia side. Yep, and that's that's Edwards Ferry right here. Then got gotcha. you. Yep. And uh, we've been catching fish on the uh, on the plastics, the small plastics. I like using the um, 16th ounce, a 16th ounce jig head or an eighth ounce jig head. Um, they're biting them both pretty much the same. 
that's that eighth ounce though seems to be getting hung up a lot more for some on reason. I, I guess rocks rocks or just in general. On, on the rocks, it gets okay. wedged a little bit a little bit easier. Uh, b- believe it or not, I mean eighth ounce isn't that heavy, but underwater, I guess it uh, it can be. Um, and then uh, the the size baits anywhere two two and three quarter to about three and a half inches. And I'm I'm using three and a half inches right now because of those uh, Helgramite baits. So why do you think the Helgramite uh, started to get good, or has it always? They always do in the summertime. I don't know. I th- I think uh, well, I think they're probably out and about more in, underwater. Mm-hmm. And um, I, I, you know, uh, the smallmouth focus more on those um, on crawdads and I guess those little crustaceans and stuff that live under rocks in the summertime because because they're just they're just full of them. They're just uh, spitting up uh, crawdads and and uh, bugs and and those uh, helgramites too when you hook them. To me, that is always interesting, whether it's you kingfishing uh, on the Shenandoah, just how much the bugs play into the small mouse diet. Like, and then mm-hmm. spoilers, uh, Nolan Miner, who won on the Susquehanna, this is going to blow your main, mind. What do you think he won $10,000 on? What do you think the bait was? Small plastic? Nope. This is going to, this will literally blow your mind. One more guess. Come on. Um, I don't know. I have no clue. Topwater spider. Really? He literally caught it on a, on a topwater spider bait that you pull across the surface. Wow. Like, yeah, yeah. If you put a gun to my head, I would be dead right now. There's no way I'd think that's what's going to catch you, you know, 18 plus pounds of smallmouth on the river. But yeah. it looked like he was like, he was casting it underneath trees and shit, which then you think like, oh, that makes sense. But mm-hmm. again, it's just so interesting with the smallmouth. They will eat such small, stupid ass baits like to, like a large mouth, eh, you know, but a small mouth. That's what's so like I always fish for them wrong as a kid. Like they will hit those little like Helgramite mm-hmm. baits so well. And it's just I don't know. It's just always so fascinating to me. They um, and, and they're and they're folk and they're um, they're concentrated on large structure right now on the uh, upper Potomac River. So y- you, you can drift the river and drift down the m- middle of it. And uh, catch them, you know, one here, one there. But you, if you find the right rock, large rock, it's it's going to have to be a rock that like dominates that stretch river. And uh, you find the right one. I mean, from day to day, who knows? There's there's several out there that they like, but you might come across one um, that just sticks out more than any any of the other ones. Mm-hmm. And um, there could be there could be ten fish on it. That happened to us this week. And wow. the fish uh, range from ten inches to uh, eighteen. That's so freaking cool. Ah, that's so cool. Yeah. Now, I mean, did you have anybody that they got to catch like one of their biggest ones yet so far? I know it's a little off. Yeah. Topic, but... Yeah. No, I did. Um, a lady this, uh, this week caught the biggest small mouse she's ever caught. Really? That's freaking awesome. In that story, that story is cool because we're fishing just below, uh, White's Ferry and we're fishing in the rocks, the, the water right up to where almost you get to White's Ferry, the water gets real swift. And, um, we're fishing area I like, and there's a bunch of little rocks and, uh, uh, there, it's just, it's just an, it's just a good spot for smallmouth. And while we're sitting there, one breaks the surface all the way over by the shoreline. This is in the m- middle of the morning, breaks hmm. the surface. This is a big fish. And, um, I, I can't, I catch it out of the corner of my eye, uh, break the surface. And I, I said, let's, let's go over there. You know, who knows? Right. I mean, that's what, a uh, f- maybe a 30% chance that the fish is going to hit again, you know, maybe. Just depends on how how aggressive they're they're feeling, I guess. So we go over there. She throws a um, a swim bait in, a four inch swim bait, and um, I watch that fish swim out from under the tree. That this water is less than a foot deep, and the water's eighty plus degrees. Right, swims out from under the tree and grabs her bait. Oh my god! They're under a tree in less than a foot of water. So it's cool. just so weird. That is so freaking weird. Do you have a that, picture that, of that? that? Do I have a picture of it? Uh, yeah. Not now. You can send it to me later. I'll use it as a thumbnail for this episode because that'd be cool to have have her thing as the thumbnail. Yeah, um, no, it, it's the, it was the biggest smallmouth she'd ever caught. So. How how's that? I, I, like the musky one, I could tell the way you told that story. Guys, go back and listen to that. I'll, I'll actually put that right up here. Um, I could tell you were like, holy shit, this is this is cool that he caught that thing. And the look uh-huh. on his face, that picture and yours. 
I mean, that's got to be like crack when somebody actually sticks like a fish, their fish of a lifetime, their PB in your boat. Yeah, I, I, I uh, that, that's what drives me. That's what uh, keeps me uh, guiding. I mean, even your look, um, by the way, this guy's a YouTube star too. He, uh, with the uh, Bass and Bros, and I'll link that yeah. in the description as well. Even the look on your face there is like, it, it, it's so rewarding when all that comes together. Cause it, it's work, it's almost like a tournament for you because you want them to catch fish. Like, uh -huh. spoil, spoil oh, yeah. guys, to people with guys, they want their clients to be super successful. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. So, like, big smallmouth, got them under there. That's freaking awesome. What made you decide to throw under trees? Well, they, they broke the surface right by the tree. Okay. And I remember like a week ago, we caught, we caught fish by that tree, but we went over there and he, he, he'd, um, I guess he was uh, going after, uh, 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 bait minnows. And, um, so I, I just, I trolled over there and she threw in immediately. It nailed it. Mm -hmm. It came out from under a tree. That was a, a, a newly, f a, tr a tree that hadn't been there very long. It had fallen into the water and uh, there was one the same size that chase the bait with it once he grabbed it oh, that's so freaking cool yeah dude that is that is freaking epic um anyway back to the um i guess i know we got on a tangent there guys but back to the the old fishery report so you said edwards fair and i have something up for you guys here's a real treat this is actually a better mapping situation so we got google earth and avionics the way god intended it so we started we went from uh point of rocks to edwards ferry uh guys again remember this google earth has better road mapping so if you want to triangulate i would say you have both up because it's a lot easier to see where the hell you are. So this is Edwards Ferry. This is Goose Creek. Uh, this is basically like the heart of Leesburg, Ashburn on the Virginia side, Maryland. I mean, Poolsville. It's very rural there, believe it or not. So from Edwards Ferry down, where else do you like to, to dabble when you're guiding? Is Go down, like that? take the, take the map down. Um, see that, see that little arm of the river right there where that Island is. Uh, this one right here. Yeah. Um, behind that island right there, you have to be real careful though, uh, when the water's low. Okay. Um, but yeah, right behind those islands, and then down further. Uh, Seneca is a tough spot because um, because most of that water it doesn't get much more than three feet deep, mm. and anywhere you can find deeper water, you're probably going to find some fish, and then. Below, below there, like I said, below Edwards Ferry, uh, once you get out in the middle, you go down about a mile, you can fish the middle of the river and catch fish in the summertime. That's, that's way below. That's below Dam 2 right there. So see how it's showing Dam 2? Yeah, what's crazy is if you look at... <laughs> Dam 2 doesn't exist anymore. It's just, uh, just kind of like a marker for it. Damn, that's crazy. And then again... The and guys, this is what I'm I'm trying to show you here is the fact is that this, yeah, I'm correct. Okay, so Navionics doesn't even have this. So if you look at Navionics on the left, guys, and this is just a good little tip for anyone out there, Navionics doesn't even show this massive riffle. It doesn't show the the remnants of Dam Two. So if you just went based on this, you would have not seen that at all. I mean, those are like class um, class two rapids down there. Yeah, you're not joking. Good lord, that's dangerous down there. But yeah, I can see this is a deeper pool then. Yeah, uh, and then that that water is okay. But when you once you start going up, right when you get up to the first island, when you go north of that, this one right, right here. When you hit that first island, right in there on either side and on up is where you'll start catching fish. Okay, this one right here, got it. Sharp yeah. tail. <laughs> that island, the the second island up. Here's here's some uh, history for uh, people that live in Montgomery County. Back during Prohibition, that island right there was well known for running moonshine or for having moonshine stills on it. Okay, that's freaking cool. And then I got to ask, how did you know that? <laughs> I found it online one time, reading <laughs> um, reading about the Upper Potomac River. That is so freaking cool. So if you can only imagine what that was like back in the 30s. Oh my in goodness, the gangster late activity. 20s, early 30s, how, how non-existent any of that stuff was, um, meaning like the, uh, the towns and how out in the middle of nowhere that actually was. Which makes sense because you're thinking like you're trying to get alcohol into D.C. for all the politicians. Like that's a <laughs> great little way to get it in there. Yeah. Oh, wow. OK, so then so really so you're talking about that corner area there. What has the bite been like then for 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 people at home? Is it a all day bite early morning? Like what what's going on on the river right now when it comes to, to bite windows? You talking to me? Yes. No, 
it's been that they've been uh, uh, they've been biting pretty much throughout the day. Okay. Uh, you, you just have to you just have to be patient, take your time, and like I said, fish structure, especially once it starts getting um, you feel like it's starting to get hot and slow. Start fishing rocks, large rocks, and fish trees. The trees that are in the middle of the river that are submerged, fish those as well. Any tree you can find. So trees and rocks then. Yeah. I mean, it, I, I know that probably people are like, well, well no joke, but that's what you're going to fish and you're going to find fish there. Now, something else that we were talking to about earlier, which I think is really interesting, is, is the runs you have to make, um, especially like this time of year. How long are you spending in an area before you're blasting off? Um, probably 15 minutes. Okay. And then I'll leave. And um, I, I probably won't spend uh, more than five to 10 minutes in, in just one spot. And then with the water clarity and the water depth being what it is, how close are you getting to these spots? So example is actually, you know what? This is, I think the best way to do it. I'm going to bring up, a, I'm going to bring up. a. Oh, I'm here. staying as far away from it as I possibly can. Because I want to show you a picture here and just to kind of like how you would approach this. This is the best picture I found. Um, I think it's a picture of the Shenandoah, but for teaching purposes, I think this will be actually really good for people at home when it comes to the, to the upper Potomac river. Um, so let's just say you blast, you're blasting upstream uh -huh. of this place. I want you to take a look at this and tell me, how would you break this down as a guide and how would you fish this area? And I'd want to fish it from, from the, um, I'd want to come up towards it. I know that I wouldn't want to fish it going down. Okay. So let's come towards it. You can control your boat a lot better fishing into the current. So then let's do that. Let's say you're, 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 you're coming upstream. So, so you launch from downstream and you're coming up to this place. Um, are you going to just fish dead center and then work your way to the sides? Like how would you approach this with, with, with customers? Oh, if, if I didn't, if, if it was a spot that really I hadn't fished yet this year, but, um, I know I can catch fish there, you know, I'm not going to take people to places. I don't, I don't normally fish. I'm going to take people to places where I know we're going to catch fish. But so let's say I hadn't, this is the first time this summer that I've hit this spot. I'm like, this is a great spot. Let's go up here. I would start in the middle. Okay. And then I would, um, I would go back and forth. I'd go to the left and right. And, and, um, we'd probably fish it pretty quick until we found, caught a fish. And then we'd sit there and try to fish a little bit, um, a little bit harder in one spot. Gotcha. So you, what you're really doing is covering water, get bit, and then make the adjustments. Yeah. Now, if this was a place that you did, let's say you've had a lot of success with in the past, and then I don't know. Uh, let's just say that my my left my left hand side where this tree is right here, around this bank is where it's been the juice. Are are you approaching that going straight from behind it, or are you coming wide and working your way in at an angle? I would probably come up. Um, I I'd probably fish into it. Okay, fish into it. You know what I mean? Down below it, mm -hmm. it even to well. where we haven't been catching fish. I'd start real slow and pull up into it. Okay, and then I'd only go so far into it if I knew there were fish there. Mm. And then depending on what the um, the uh, like the structure was and how shallow it is, if I know like on the shoreline, if if I'm thinking about a spot where you're talking about. Um, uh, for me, looking at the screen to the right, you see the, the white water over there to the right. Is it right where my mouse is or the other side? Point your mouse again. I can't see your mouse. It's not showing me. Oh, there, there it is. Nope. The other side right here, right there. I would come up, see where the shoreline is. Yeah. Right here. I'd come up the shoreline real slow. If, if, if I, I knew that was just like, um, a crap spot to fish. I'd come up that shoreline and fish into that bigger, that bigger area, area where that white water is. If I'm confident that you're probably not going to catch fish on that shoreline, I'm going to ride that shoreline all the way up. Just like fish. that. Got it. Yeah. And fish into it. That's interesting. Okay. Interesting. Interesting. How important are riffles? Like if you ever read the old Bassmasters and stuff, they basically said always fish like the riffles, the shallowest water with all this, this stuff right here. Yeah. They, they, they get into that. They, uh, it's supposed to have more oxygen and then it's supposed to be a lot more, uh, um, it's supposed to be like a cool breeze to the fish. 
like like it would for us, like a, a, a cool breeze in the summertime hmm. with all that water moving. Mm -hmm. It's supposed to be, um, uh, you know, an area where they can get out of the, the, the heat, so to speak. So then when you're fishing these areas, like how long are you going to spend on this compared to like a deeper hole? Cause I'm assuming like an area like this, it's only going to have like one or two, right? Can they get stacked up in there? Yeah. Yeah. You can catch fish in a spot like that. Um, it just depends on how many fish we're catching there Okay. and how long it takes. I mean, could you sit there for an hour and probably pick off five fish? Sure. But if I'm guiding, I'm not going to do that. I'm going to, I'm going to move on if we catch one fish and in 15 minutes, we don't catch anything. We're going to leave. Gotcha. 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 Because of the, okay. uh, cause, cause we're under a time clock. Now, is there anything else in this spot though that, that you think would, would be worth for people to check out? Yeah. The, the rock in the middle. Uh, this one right here. Yeah. If there's deep water behind it. Okay. And Good then, stuff. um, and then if you, if you can get up in there with your boat, you can, uh, with a spot lock, you can spot lock it and let your, uh, let the people that are with you throw into the ripples behind it. Okay. Okay. That's really good stuff there. Yeah. Cause like, I think a lot of people, if you're, this is like, I think a classic, um, bank fishing spot or, or waiting spot, something like that. But you look at this, people probably don't even know like where to actually begin. Um, yeah. especially in the summertime. Now, granted, maybe a place like this, you could probably cast the whole thing, but to me, and, and this is, you know, I, I have limited knowledge of this. I'm afraid of spooking them. Like, cause you feel like your first couple of casts have to be on it. Cause if you're waiting or you bring a boat in there and you spook them, like that spot's like, I think it would be dead. It would so, be. Yeah. Like how far away? I mean, let's, okay. Here's a great example. You said like this part of the bank here. Uh, yeah. Hugging the bank. I'm saying if the shoreline, if I know that we're not, we're not going to catch fish in that shoreline and it's kind of just a crappy shoreline, there's nothing to it. Mm -hmm. And let's say it's, it's um, maybe six inches deep and I can get the boat through there with the trolling motor. We're going to go up through there real slow. And then cast to the uh, to the middle of the river. So you're going to be casting to the X's basically. Yeah. And then you're going to keep the boat there because that does basically give you this whole area to fish. Okay, that makes sense. Yeah. And then once once I feel like we fished it, I'll start moving into it. Okay. And then I'll go all the way across. So you're going to work up, and then you're going to work across like this. Yeah. Mm hmm. Okay. Guys, that's really good information at home from a guide just to really tell you about how to break this place down. Because again, like unlike a lake that's you know, 100 feet deep where you can probably get over top of them and stuff, these rivers, when they get shallow like that, those fish do get spooky. Um, and if you blow out an area, it's going to take some time. I mean, that's actually a, probably a good question that people have at home. Like if you blow out an area or you're on the trolling motor and then you see the spot that you're in, you see two smallmouth big ones start off. Do you gonna give that place a rest, or is it just like, up? Oh, that's done for the day? Yeah, they're they're probably you probably spooked them off. You probably spooked them off. Yeah. All right, sweet. So, and with that, guys, that's kind of like our, our little one on one about how to fish or how to approach like kind of the Upper Potomac when it comes from a, a strategy standpoint. Uh, I, anything off of, on the fishing report when it comes not just a smallmouth? Is there anything else that you're seeing that's that's really interesting right well, now? Well, we we we've caught fish on crankbaits too. Really? Small baits that are um, going down to about four, four or five feet. Okay. Early in the morning, throwing into the shallow water and bringing out to the, you know, out towards, uh, towards us in the middle. I wouldn't have expected that. That's pretty yeah, cool. Yeah, crank baits. Um, what else have we been, we've been using? Um, some top water, but the top water really, they, they really haven't really responded real well to the top water. Hmm. Uh, you can lose your... Uh, you can lose yourself in throwing those topwater baits. I mean, you just, before you know it, an hour has gone by, you haven't caught a, a darn thing. Dude, it's addictive. Yeah, but it but it's fun. But the, the, my whole purpose of throwing a topwater bait is to see if we can catch the biggest fish possible that day. Mm -hmm. You know, right off the bat. Because those topwater baits catch big fish. Just absolutely monster fish. Have you caught anything besides smallmouth lately? Yeah, or flatheads. Really? Flathead fishing, yeah. How? I, I take people catfishing too. All right. I need to have that story. Like, uh, how's that been going? Like what's going on with that? It's, it's okay. It's been going pretty good. Um, I mean, we're catching flatheads between 10, um, the biggest are between 10 and 20 pounds. Okay. And, what's... um, go, go ahead. ahead. <laughs> it's all you, you go. Okay. And, uh, we're using live bait. Okay. How, you for the people at home, cause we definitely want to get into more catfishing here. That's the thing people are like really clamoring for me to cover as well. 
I mean, the floor is yours with that. Cause I know we have to do a rigging segment uh, that we're going to be doing here, a technique segment, but let's talk first about like your, your catfish setup. Like how do you approach the river for that? Like just get into well, that first. The flathead's just a, a, a real quick and easy way to, to, to fish for them is I fish for them in the warmer months. Um, you know, you, you're going to use live bait for them. Uh, if you can catch bluegill, use bluegill. And um, you're going to find the deepest hole in, in whatever stretch of river you like to fish. All right. And I'm finding them in seven to eight feet of water. Okay. And they like trees too. They like to stay under, under trees and, and um, stay up, a, up above on the um, upside of a, of a real big rock ledge. And uh, you're just throwing out. And I'll tell you, flatheads are real strange fish. They're, they're different than channel catfish in that they, um, they'll come up and they'll bite your bait and you'll see a rod bend and then they'll stop and then they'll come back again. It could take you five to 10 minutes before you actually catch that fish. They're very wary, aren't they? Wow. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I mean, they're ugly as, can, uh, ugly as can be. Uh, apparently, they're not supposed to be in the upper Potomac River. That they use the word um, invasive for them. Yeah, we have a uh, we have somebody coming on this show uh, from the Maryland DR. Hopefully, I think it's your boy. Actually, um, we got him scheduled just to kind of talk about that because it, it's such a weird thing. Because yeah, they are invasive, but there is a cult following for them, just like the snake yeah. too. Um, and I want to hear both sides of the argument. One thing I do know is they get big and they pull hard. Oh yeah, um, I don't think I I could be wrong because I'm not up above like dam five or um, I'm not fishing for them up around dam four. Uh, I don't think you're going to find one in the Potomac river yet. That's more than uh, 30 pounds. It's on the Susquehanna. Yeah. Susquehanna. Three. Yeah. They've been there longer. I'm going to say like, there might be a rogue one every now and then yeah. on the upper Potomac, but they will get there. It's oh yeah. There. No, they're, I mean, though, uh, if, if, if they stay in the river and, um, and they just become another fish there. You, you you might be able to find them pushing fifty pounds one day. Like I know up where I live, I'm bringing this up here. Oh, there it is. Um, it is getting kind of bad. So if you guys go up, and you know, because I'm going to get death threats on this one. So <laughs> you have Dam Four here, which is called the Big Slack Water. That's right here. If you go up to Williamsport, um, this is in between dam four and five where the conica jig comes in this whole stretch here is insane for cat yep. uh flatheads right now um i think they mm -hmm. I think they were introduced quote unquote yeah, they were. dam four or five area was really where they were put in the most and so that's where you're, that's kind of ground zero for them mm -hmm. and it's it's sporty like they're in there um and they're thick and I don't know. I think there's rumors. I don't have picture evidence of ones that are 30 pounds. I've heard gossip of it, but I haven't had photo like ID of it. Yeah. But but I know like it, it's it's regardless, like they're going to get there eventually the 30, 40 pound class catfish. Um, I'm just worried what it's going to do to like the smallmouth fishing, because I've heard the rumors that like the Suskies seen it where like the smallmouth behavior has changed a little bit. Yeah, they've moved. They're not in holes that they once were. I think that's all. I, I think that's what we're going to experience. Are, are you seeing that yet? Probably. Yeah. I mean, I, I think so. I, I think um, now that I know they're there and mm -hmm. I've been catching them and I, 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 I see what they're like. I mean, their, their mouth is like a uh, five gallon bucket, you know? And um, I think that they're, uh, uh, they're changing the way smallmouth. mouth, uh, uh, move especially like in the winter time and stuff some of these deep holes that used to have them uh they're, they're just not there anymore mm -hmm. i think they're finding alternative places to uh to to go in in winter and that's a scary thing too to think about it is if, if they take over the deep holes is that going to <clears throat> decrease the the ex life expectancies on these smallmouth in the winter times when we get these cold winters, are they not going to winter in the deeper holes? Is that going to affect them at all? Well, like, I mean, a, a deep um, a hole that they can winter in in the winter time and and just and hang out and survive could be four feet deep. Now, would that be the same hole they would? I guess my point is like, is that the same hole that they would be in if the flathead weren't there, or would they be deeper? No, no, that they'll they'll go in four and three feet of water in winter and stay there because they move around. Okay. Um, but, uh, are they going to go in deeper holes, like eight, seven, eight feet, nine like, feet, certain like places? I don't know. 
No, uh, but, you know, I'm not finding them in those places. That doesn't I, mean they're not there. I've heard that too on the Susquehanna too. It's because of the, they think it's because of the flats, but again, I, I I'm going to try to get more people, the DNR and stuff on the show to kind of talk about that more, uh, explain that to us. Uh, but, but back to the flathead catfishing, how are you rigging up the live bait? I mean, I, I'm assuming you're not using 10 pound test. No, I, I have a, a 50 pound braid and then I just, uh, I have a leader tied to a, a large swivel and okay. it's 30 pounds. I, I guess you could say the stuff I'm using is kind of like, like ta light, light tackle for them. I'm using a medium rod, seven foot rod, um, with, uh, a 4,000 series reel. If that kind of gives you an idea. Mm -hmm. And, um. That's what I'm using. And then I'm using a large hook. Uh, I don't know, five out hook. Wow. And um, you can use like a one ounce sinker. But what I've been doing is um, because because I have a, a molds that I can pour um, split shots in. I can I can make real large split shots and I put about three on the line hmm. and I just hook the uh, the bait and throw them out. OK. And and it, it takes them to the bottom. I mean, if, if I needed more weight, I would use a an ounce um, sinker or something like that or something. I think I'm close to an ounce with those uh, three split shots. That's how big they are. How long are you staying in a spot in general before you move with flatheads? Is it pretty much just any big hole will work and just stay there until you catch one? Or do you have a vibe? No, um, I've learned about 15 minutes, 15, 15 to 20 minutes. And then you're going to move wow. that fast. If they're not biting, um, move. And when I say move, I'm not talking about move 100 yards up the river. I'm talking about moving um to the left or right 20 feet <laughs> that's it really yeah. yeah and i i think they're um a friend of mine we've, we've talked about this i think they're um uh real lazy fish in the summertime during the day and uh they're not going to move more than five or ten feet for bait mm -hmm. and i think if you just move over to the left or right you'll get a better position on them and then they'll decide to come over and um investigate but in the in the, in the at nighttime I think they're all over the river. I think they're in three feet of water and probably those bigger, the real big ones, the ones that we, we don't, you know, think might that aren't reaching 30 pounds or I think these real big ones, I think maybe they're coming out at night. Oh, I, I yeah, hundred percent. Like, I mean, I, I, I think I wouldn't be surprised if I went out there one night messing around trying to see what we could catch. And we caught one that was uh, pushing 25 pounds or maybe more. I could totally see you doing night fishing charters here some point, like for catfish. Like that definitely. I do. I, I offer them for, for, oh, for channel go. cats. <laughs> um, but uh, I'd rather go after the flatheads at this point. They're just bigger and people like big, yeah. like I, it, it, whether it's bluegill, bass, catfish, musky, like it, it's okay. That's a good question too, as a guy. Like do people, would people rather in general catch a quantity or is it the quality? Like, well, it, it depends. Um, it, it depends on um, if they're uh, I think if they're, uh, new fishermen, you know, like it, not new, if they don't fish very much, let's say someone goes out with a guide and maybe they only fish three, two, three times a year. I think they'd love to catch a really big fish over 10, you know, 15, 20 fish. Mm -hmm. But if there's someone that fishes a lot, but let's say they're in town and they want to come fishing with me and they want to go for smallmouth, um, they want to catch a lot of fish. That's how I feel. It's just, it's so, yeah, it's just so interesting because like I know with Odenkirk uh, and we had a couple people on from the Department of Wildlife Resources for Virginia, their narrative has changed too, that people want to catch trophies. And so it's about growing trophy mm -hmm. class victories. And I, I feel like I'm seeing that too with everybody, like the allure of a flathead or a snakehead or a muskie is that, that trophy size thing, that, that thing that no one else can catch for bragging rights. And I, it's interesting to see for better or worse with the flathead that the flathead population here. Are we going to have that here in our back door where people can catch 40 pound, you know, I'm hoping. I mean, I, I hope it, it doesn't affect the, the river and I hope that we can catch those fish with, you know, in the perfect world and still yeah. have our small mouth. That would be fun. Oh, it'd be, it'd be a lot of fun. And it opens up more doors for just like guides too, things like that. Cause like, again, yeah. like flat catfishing, I, I think, and again, we'll have, we'll have other guys on the show too, to kind of, argue my point but like catfishing and snakehead fishing is usually the best when the bass fishing is is usually at its worst and that's like when the dog days of summer september ish area that's yeah. when those bites get really good yeah what is the biggest flathead you've caught so far probably oh the biggest one i've i've caught one on the susquehanna um uh in the winter time 
man, I caught one. I'll have to send you a picture. I, I it's probably close to 30 pounds. I call it on, on, uh, you know, bass tackle, bass gear, um, with a tube. It was gigantic. It just, it, it surfaced like a submarine when I got it to the, um, got it out up off the bottom. And guys, that's as big as I've, yeah. that's as big as I've caught. For you guys that don't know at home, like, yeah, these are, these are what we're talking about here. They'll, they'll readily uh, go after uh, bass, uh, bass lures as well. Oh, uh, they're just, they're, they're a true are, apex predator. They're so aggressive. And, and when you think catfishing, you think like little channel cats, things like that. These guys yeah. know. No, I mean, these are, these are, these are the type of fish that you go noodling for. Yeah, no, hard, no, hard pass there. But those yeah. things are freaking insane. Yeah, Absolutely they're, crazy. They're pretty good. They're supposed to be the best tasting uh, catfish out of the three. Hey, they're a prize in a lot of waters. Like people love to catch flatheads, um, mm -hmm. but they are so, they're very, very carnivorous and they will eat anything that moves that that's, you know, smaller than they are. They're they're kind of snobs when it comes to food that, that they want live bait. They don't want they don't want chicken liver. They don't want anything that a channel cat might eat. Uh, I, I mean, I, I guess blue cats eat live stuff, too. But I, I think blue cats also eat um, mm -hmm. uh, stuff off the bottom, dead stuff, too. Yeah. And that is uh, only look for or only really interested in live live food. And these get much bigger than channel cats. Yes, they do. So when you're guiding with this, are you usually going out with like, how are you catching your bait? I guess, is, do you go to a bait dealer? Or do you catch it yourself? No, we just use small light tackle. All right. And then you just catch the bait there. Yeah. Gotcha. Yeah. Cause bluegill guys, I mean, that is, and again, make sure you check with, uh, just so no one here gets in trouble, check with wherever you are about live bait rules. So you don't get dinged or you know, arrested and shit, but I mean, usually, you, can, you can only have so many, um, per person anyways in a boat, I believe. Yeah. I want to so say it's like 15. Maybe I'm wrong about that, but uh, uh, I know the crappie, it's like 15. Yeah, and it is legal because I know I, I've gotten hit for that for using bluegills cut bait before. It is legal. You just got to make sure they're within the right limit. But yeah, it's perfectly fine to use that as bait as long as you're not transferring crap across state lines and all that other no. stuff. I mean, I, I, can't see, I can't see how using fish from the same river you're going to fish in can be a bad thing. Well, it, yeah, because I've heard people because, again, it's like the Maryland side versus the Virginia side. And I think it's because you got Ashburn and Leesburg and a lot of people are transient and don't understand, like, how all this stuff works. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think that's a big thing is the misinformation. But anyway, I don't want to go on that tangent. We'll save that for another show now. So, guys, again, uh, before we switch gears to the kind of like the technique uh, to wrap this thing up for smallmouth. Also, please like and subscribe to him go down click in the episode description all this stuff book a guiding trip with him he doesn't just do smallmouth bass as you've heard here he's getting into catfishing which is really cool it's a lot of fun it's more of a sit and chill it's a different type of vibe but it's still a lot of fun yep and then really i mean let's just get into it like the thing that the thing of august what is the august technique that you'll be sharing with us for el smally mouth i think what i'm going to start getting into is um now is flukes mm. over here we got these four inch flukes. Oh, there you go. Perfect. Little four inch flukes, either tails. Yeah. Wow. Stuff like this. And then um, uh, one technique on uh, fishing with them. And then I have a, the, a smaller one like this right here. Uh, my colors aren't going to get too fancy because all I really like using is green pumpkin, black, or some type of brown. But here's something right here. Oh. can kind of like two tone them too at times. I like that color. But, but um, let me grab it. So how, I, how I'm going to set them up. This is one way. You can set them up with a uh, hook uh, where, you, where you Texas rig them. But you can also set them up where you nose hook them. See how I have it nose hooked with a mm -hmm. like a mosquito type hook. Wow. Just a small hook. And then... Um, at the top, use a small uh, split shot. I wouldn't go any bigger than like an eighth ounce. Okay. And just like that. And then you throw it out and let it go to the bottom. And uh, work it like you'd work a tube or, a, or some other type of small uh, soft plastic. Because yeah. when that thing hits the water, it, it, um, the weight just pulls it down and it, and it just kind of goes down real slow. 
Now, how, um, just explain for people at home, like, how are you working that thing just to visualize it? Are you casting the thing straight upstream? Are you casting at an angle and just letting it just drift? Are you, I'm going to cast it. Yeah. Either upstream. I'm probably going to, what I'm going to do is I'm going to cast it into, um, into slow moving water. I'm going to okay. try to find water. That's, uh, uh, that's slow. Uh, and there's faster water around it. And we're going to throw up into that. And then you're going to let the current just take it. And then what, what rod and reel setup are you using with that? Medium light, seven foot and, um, a 1000 to 2000 series reel. Some people like 2,500, I guess you can go that high. Um, braided line. You, you, you want, you want this to be as sensitive as possible because they might pick this up on slack line because you're throwing it out. And before you can get the line um, tight to start popping it through the water, you know, bouncing it off the bottom, they might have already picked it up. Okay. So you're going to use braided line somewhere around, I uh, like 25 pound test um, braided line, which is probably equivalent to what, like eight pound, um, eight, eight pound mono or something like that. Roughly. And then um, uh, eight pound of fluorocarbon, like this stuff right here. Nice. You can see okay. this clear, just clear fluorocarbon. And uh, the line I, I like using is Gamma. Sponsor gamma point. Huh? I said, is that your sponsor plug? No, it's my, it's, I sell it. <laughs> oh, okay. That's even better. Uh, yeah. hold, hold that up again. Like just was just so pe people can actually see it just to Gamma. So that's it right there, guys. So Gamma Edge fluorocarbon. I'm, uh, I'm turning it around on the backside so you can see what it's saying too. Yeah. Uh, eight pound test, 100 yards. And that's the other thing too. I've gotten a lot of questions about this. Why do you go braid to like a leader material? One thing that I think is interesting is cost saving. Fluorocarbon, high quality fluorocarbon is a little bit more expensive, mm -hmm. but braid will last a, a good while. So if you guys get comfortable with not tying, you actually save some money when you yeah. just use leader material. Now this stuff, this stuff's hard to find, but this stuff right here, I don't sell this stuff. This is, um, yeah, this is um, Sunline. And uh, this stuff's awesome. I use eight pound, eight to 10 pound, but I would use about eight pound and I would use a rod's length of um, fluorocarbon on your, uh, on your setup and, and go from there. Some people will even set there. If the water's super clear, they'll go with straight fluorocarbon. Yeah. And that's, that's a really good tip too, guys, is don't be bashful with leader size. I know some people like example, if I'm fishing super light stuff, let's say, uh, I'm fishing really pressured ponds and I'm going four or five pound test fluorocarbon. I'll put 10, 15 feet of it. That way, if I hook something, I'll get the knot inside the reel when the fish is super close. If you're going light line, you don't want the, the, the leader so small that you're fighting that fish next to the boat with the knot out of the, uh, of the rod, because that's when you're going to get the snap. You want to make sure you get the knot within the reel when that fish is close. And that just to clear, clarify too, I showed you the two different fluorocarbons. I use both of them. And they're both um, they're both high quality, um, and uh, they're both hard to find. Though, I mean, I have the uh, Gamma Edge available, mm -hmm. but the um, the Sunline it's hard to find. If you wanted to get Sunline, you can get it at like um, Tackle Warehouse. You have to go online for it. Uh, you, you can't go to somewhere like Bass Pro or Cabela's and buy a quality line like that. And it's also guys better like for something like that, get it online too. Cause you want to make sure that the line hasn't been sitting there for a while. That's the one thing um, yeah. with, especially fishing line. If you go to a mom and pop shop, something like that, ask them how long the line has been there because fluorocarbon, if it's been there for like a hundred years, it's going to have issues. You want to make sure it's, it's, it's freshly new fluorocarbon line. And I've been messing around with um, braided line for a while, depending, you know, the different sizes, 15 pound, 20 pound, 25 pound, 30 pound. And I think a good, uh, I have 30 pound right here, but I oh, think wow. 25 pound is good. And the, and the reason why is it doesn't knot up on people. Mm. I mean, I'm taking people of all different skill levels out. And um, uh, uh, sometimes when they cast, they, uh, uh, they just don't cast it very well. That happens. And then um, they'll get tangled up. Okay. And it seems to me the heavier... I mean, don't go crazy. Don't use 50 pound braid. It's like wire, but, uh, 30 pound, I mean, I'm sorry, 25 pound to 20 pound, uh, seem to, um, kind of alleviate that issue. What and, do they call them? Wind knots? Is that yeah. what people call them? Yeah. Yeah. And that's something important. This is just a suggestion on my part for the people that are listening to your catfishing. One issue that gives catfishmen a bad rap is when they, they snag 
their hooks in rocks and they cut their braid. And then you have, you know, 100 feet of braid. I would really suggest you use a swivel and then you get a, a fluorocarbon or monofilament leader that is that is less pound test than your main line. So if you break, you break there, you maintain your rig, but then you're not leaving 700 feet of braided line just floating in the river to get hung up on fishing hooks, trolling motors, props, things of that ilk. Uh, it, it'll save you money too, because then you get to actually keep your weight and your swivel. But then you're not also just leaving all that crap out there. I know one of my friends, and I think I posted on my Facebook, there was an owl that he actually caught that got snagged on a bunch of braided line that was in a tree. Um, this was when he was fishing, and it was probably you know people who were bank fishing. So just just a tip there, you know, make sure that you can go a hundred pound test braid or whatever you want to do, but then go to like I don't know fifty pound mono between the swivel and the hook that way if that gets snagged you break that off and you still maintain your weight in your swivel but you're not leaving 200 feet of braid just floating in the river for for this man to be out there and get snagged on his prop <laughs> like that because it it's annoying <laughs> but yeah guys yeah th thank thank this man again thank you so much for coming on the show i really appreciate it jeff is there anything else that you, you really want to talk about or bring light to well, no, just this, this, this setup right here. I mean, it's not much, it's not, it's not super fancy. It's, it's not as, um, it's not as fancy as the, the drop shot or anything like that, but, but you have to maintain some type of, uh, contact with the bottom. If you're going to fish something like this, because this okay. thing's just going to be tumbling in the water. Gosh. And, then, and then every now and then you can even pop it and then it's going to come up and it's going to flutter and it's going to go back down. What is the bite like on that? Cause I know what the, um, I, and I've, I've had, we've had conversations about this on the show when you're just fishing a regular fluke weedless or, or I'm sorry, weightless. It's really hard to detect that bite. With yeah. That it's a shot. What is it like? It's um, you're going to feel it. You're going to, if you're using the, um, you know, uh, the, I wouldn't call it the correct setup, but if you're using the setup we were talking about the braid to the fluorocarbon, you're going to feel a tap mm -hmm. and you're going to feel that even on uh, somewhat slack line. And uh, you got to set the hook on them. So you can't wait for these fish to take it. The minute you feel them, you got to set the hook on them. You got you to pull back. Okay. You want to pull straight up on them. You don't want to pull, you know, the best you can. I mean, if you're in a bad spot and you got to pull to the left or right, then you got to set the hook that way. But you want to pull straight up on them when you get a bite. Lift up. Good deal. Good deal. Guys. And, um, and it, it doesn't, doesn't have to be a, uh, you don't have to rip their face off when you set the hook. It's kind of like a finesse hook set. Just lift up on them. Especially you want kids, your, your rod tip's going to be facing upward. And you're going to be fishing. And if you start feeling something, you know, you're, you're feeling it and you're reeling, you start feeling, just keep pulling back. You don't need to reel down and set the hook. If you reel down and set the hook, you'll probably miss them. That's another good tip. Now, do you ever use circle hooks when you, when you do? Yeah, this one's hook? kind of, this mosquito hooks like a circle hook right here. It oh, is. That's what it says right. on the package. But, um, nice. it, uh, they work well. You can even use, you can use bigger hooks too. Don't get me wrong. I, I like, I like using smaller, smaller hooks and stuff, but you can use a hook about this size too. This isn't a circle hook. It's just a, just a regular hook. Hmm. It's got that bend in it though, like that. So Get, getting back to, to the river real quick before, before we finish up here, sure. uh, when would you consider like the tributaries to be back on for fishing? Like, is it more of just the primary main stem of the upper Potomac or would you go into little Seneca, Monocacy, Goose Creek, do they ever play in the summertime or is that more of a fall thing? Yeah. If the water's high, that's the biggest thing. Yeah. If the water's high, but in the fall, um, in late fall, when we start, you know, when we get rain and, um, the river is showing like three and a half, like at, at or point of rocks, three and a half feet or point of, or I'm sorry. Yeah. Point of rocks is three and a half feet. Edwards Ferry is like five or something like that, or six feet. You could try going up into the, uh, tributaries then too. Okay. In the fall. Good deal for everybody at home listening. Like, you know, like that doesn't mean you can't fish them from the bank, but that just means from a boat, by the way. I mean, there's always fish up in these, uh, in these creeks and some of them probably just live up there. I mean, they just, they don't really leave the creeks. They like them. But, um, if you want to get into a bunch of fish, I find that like this, the Monocacy fishes real well in September, late September, especially if the water comes up. When, when does the fall bite get going? Is it, are you, I'm so let me rephrase that. 
are you looking for the leaves to change a water temperature? Like what is your vibe? Like, Oh, yeah, let's go down water temperature, water temperature. I think, I think the ideal temperature to catch smallmouth in is probably right around 55 degrees. Yeah. I agree I, with that. I mean, they, they really like, um, colder, chillier water, uh, you know, 55, 60 degrees. And, and, uh, and like you said, the leaves changing somewhere around uh, late October, around Halloween and into, into November, early November. Okay. Good. When you good start stuff. getting these, uh, these cold fronts coming in. Yeah. And that's and like a jerk bait. Oh yes. Yeah. Suspending jerk bait. I don't yes. know. Why people, I don't know why people want to want to fight the suspending jerk bait, throw a suspending jerk bait and uh, you'll catch some of the biggest small mouth. And largemouth on the river you've ever seen in your life. You get me jazzed. It's coming, guys. Like that is there's there's some kind of like mystique window there between that October, November time frame where that the river is any river is just fire. Like and it's not there's just a window. Window. oh, it's oh it, it's the best time. Like I, I think for pure fun. Like again, we can argue about when you can catch your biggest ones, like maybe the winter time, whatever, but just for pure you're not working too hard to catch a bunch of fish. Mm -hmm. it, it's, it's insane. Absolutely insane. I mean, that, that suspending jerk bait bite is the coolest bite in the world. You're popping the, the uh, lure through the water, depending on how cold it is too and how fast you're popping it. You're popping it. It's a slack line and you tighten it up. You pop it again. You go to pop it another time and your rod goes nowhere. Your rod just bends over your, and it feels like you've snagged a stump. That's so cool. And then it, and then it starts. Um, and you start feeling it head shaking. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's ah. it, to me. That's the that's the coolest bite in the world. I know people um, will probably say that they like the top water because it's so, um, it, it, you know, you can see it. And then some people will say they really like a, a spinner bait bite. I think a spinner bait bite's really a uh, really violent when they when they strike it. Sometimes you can actually see it, but there's there's just something about that jerk bait bite. Yeah, I mean, they grab all, all what is it, six or nine of those hooks, man, and um, and I mean, they they just mean business when they when they hit those uh, jerk baits in the fall. It's just the aggression of it too, like that that window. They just eat with such a ferocity compared to mm -hmm. like I even think the springtime that 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 fall yeah. bite is so much. Just they kill anything you throw at them. I mean, they will rip the rod out of your hand. I mean, they hit those suspending jerk baits like the Lucky Crafts and Mega Basses. Rapala, all those, all those type of jerk, spinning jerk baits. They hit them right when they hit the water too. It's mm -hmm. like they're waiting for them. Like they see them coming. Oh yeah. And what's so crazy. It's like, I didn't know a lot of people that don't want to fish that time. And it's like, if you want to take your kid, your girlfriend, your wife fishing and have success, it really is. That's the time you can get them hooked on fishing compared to the summertime or the winter or spring, because it's just stupid fishing. It's stupid proof. Just, just yeah. cast real and they're going to eat and they're going to get hooked on it. So make sure you book a time with him, guys, in that window, that that late October to November, because I, I promise you, you're not going to be disappointed. It's going to be absolute fire. Yeah. But again, yes. Jeff, thanks again for coming on the show. Uh, link to him, episode description down below, everything, all of his information. Again, August, it's it's a doldrum out there. But if you follow all of his tips, you're going to have success. And then maybe catfishing, guys. Maybe that's an option. Go catfishing with him, because that's going to be the next best, greatest thing on the Upper Potomac. We'll talk to you guys next time on Fishing the DMV. Bye. You're listening to Fishing the DMV with your hosts, Thomas Ahrens and Jared Mounts. Fishing the DMV is brought to you by Jake's Bait and Tackle, located in Winchester, Virginia. If that doesn't get you jacked up, I don't know what will.